Finding a great white. Porkers? Talking about Porkers? Mr. Hooper? Just tie me a sheep shank. I haven't had to pass basic seamanship in a long time. You didn't say how short you wanted it. How's that? Give me your hands. And welcome back to another episode of the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Episode 35, Tie Me a Sheepshank. This is a topic I've been wanting to get to for a long time now. We have cause for celebration here in the Jaws Obsession bunker. Just yesterday, I hit save on the final chapter to the Book of Quint. There's still an editing process to go through. But for the most part, what we have now is we have 54 chapters to the Book of Quint. Part 1 is 17 chapters. Part 2 is chapters 18 to 47. Part 3 is chapters 48 to 54. And the, the whole process has been many victories. I think it was 12 or 13 books uh, during the research phase, and as well as taking trips to Martha's Vineyard, and to really just get deep-rooted into Jaws lore, the Jaws mentality, in uh, being in that Jaws environment. It's been a really great ride to even get to this point, and that's why these are little mini-victories to actually get the entire story out and constructed into a novel format. More than half of it has yet to be edited, but we are well on our way. This is 54 chapters It's looking like it's going to top out. It's going to reach around the 490 pages. This is an epic story. This is not something to be taken lightly. There's a lot going on to Jaws, and what I wanted to do was the due diligence to make every Jaws fan proud that's out there to know that their movie is going to be taken care of going forward because we're going to learn more about these characters And we're going to enjoy Jaws that much more knowing the full story. You would think we could phone it in and just kind of sit back and have a few light episodes, but we're not going to do that. We're keeping our foot on the accelerator and we're moving forward. We have this episode, we're going to reveal some amazing uh, inside information about the characters of Jaws. And then the next episode, we have another revelation. And well, we have a big surprise coming up, not just the next episode, but the episode after that. So we have these next three episodes, this one plus, uh, we have 35 
and 36 and 37 are going to be very, very exciting because we're going to be revealing new information and we're going to have a celebration of that the Book of Quint is coming down. The light is at the end of the tunnel. It's coming down the tracks and it is coming at us fast. So this is very exciting. Everyone's just leaving great comments over at Apple uh, iTunes or they're liking or subscribing the show on Spotify or YouTube. They're sending emails in. You can email me here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com or you can leave comments over on the podcasting platform of your choice. And I always appreciate the words of support that come in here in regards to the Book of Quint and the Jaws obsession because what we're doing is something completely different. We're not just talking about Jaws. We're trying to increase the Jaws universe and to expand the Jaws universe and push the idea forward that there is a bigger story to the movie Jaws. A lot of listeners are getting that, and it's very nice to see. Over at Apple Podcasts, we had uh, Heath 1975 wrote in, Amazing podcast, The Jaws Obsession, well done, really captures the excitement of the movie. I really enjoy the details of each episode and looking forward to reading the book of Quint. Thank you very much for that five-star review and those words of encouragement, Heath, 1975. There's so much to Jaws. We could do shows for a while. There's a lot going on. And as you're going to see today, we're going to take 30 seconds of the movie and we're going to extract information out of just 30 seconds. And so I, as you learn about the details, I am learning about these details as well. Some of these discoveries, I work with John Tedder. It will take months to develop, weeks you, th you sit there and you think about the details. You reach a conclusion once you discuss it or you verbalize that. And so while you're learning as a listener, I am learning with doing these shows. And that has increased the efficiency and the effectiveness of the writing in the Book of Quint. The Book of Quint would not be what it is right now without this broadcast, without all of you coming along with me on this journey. So we had another five-star review, and this was from user Fitz on the Air. He left a five-star review said podcasting at its best as the owner of a podcast studio i can find many flaws with even the best and most popular podcasts if you look hard enough you can find flaws everywhere this podcast is a master class in podcasting best podcast about jaws which is the greatest movie ever made fits and that is a comment left by scott fitzgerald from pittsford new york thank you very much mr fitzgerald We've been in contact. Mr. Fitzgerald has a professional recording studio, works on podcasts, works with other podcasters. It's very humbling said being this being called a master class in podcasting. We I really don't have any formal training on this. It's just the passion and excitement about the material that drives this. But what Mr. Fitzgerald has done is that he's an extreme jaws fan and wanted to help out. And so this is about all of us coming together and making this possible as Jaws fans, that each of us can do our own little part. Aside from myself writing the novel, there's ways you can tell all your friends or there's ways you can tell on your social media people about this broadcast or the Book of Quint and get people excited about this. And Mr. Fitzgerald has gone above and beyond and lent his time in his recording studio for a secret uh, project that we have coming up. And we're, I'm very excited. I can't wait to share that with you in the next few weeks. So thank you very much, Scott Fitzgerald. We look forward to hearing from you more on the Jaws Obsession. We also share the podcast. We have a YouTube channel, Jaws Obsession, over at youtube.com. Paul B. wrote in, I just found your podcast yesterday. I can't believe I had no idea about it. I am on this episode right now on my Pocket Cast player. Great show. He is on episode eight, Mystery of the Brody Shoulder Towel which we still have yet to find an answer to. See, that's the, that's the thing with the Jaws obsession is that we are not uh, all knowing, is that I don't have all the answers and that if someone is out there with more information, by all means, let me know. Write in to jawsob2025 at gmail.com or just go on the video over at YouTube or the podcast platform that you're on and leave a comment right there. I'll see it and I'll be able to incorporate that and either make corrections or add information in. But the mystery of the Brody shoulder towel is still out there. We still have yet to find out what that whole towel on his shoulder was all about. It definitely carries a meaning. So that episode, episode eight, if anyone hasn't listened to that, that's still an ongoing Jaws mystery that has yet to be solved. Thank you very much, Paul B., for liking the show and for going through the episode, starting at episode one and just going one at a time. 
We also had a response through email from Kevin A., who wrote in and revealed that he is user The Dude, who left that great comment that we talked about that inspired the Jaws Columbo episode, which was episode 34. Kevin wrote in with some details regarding when he saw Jaws back in 1975 in Montclair, New Jersey, at the Clare Ridge Theater. And every night the line was around the entire block for months to get in. The night we saw it, it was a packed theater and we had to sit in the front row looking up. I will never forget how scared I was during the opening scene uh, with Chrissy Watkins. That summer I was literally afraid to go into a pool, never mind the Jersey Shore. And Kevin continued on with his email. He wrote a very, very nice comment. He said, I told my daughter tonight that writing you is like writing Peter Benchley before the original Jaws was published in the early 1970s, and how cool it would be if your book gets made into a best-selling movie to enrich the Jaws legacy. I appreciate you and will be listening to next Tuesday's uh, podcast. Take care and God bless. Regards, Kevin A. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm very humbled by the Peter Benchley analogy. We have to realize we owe all of this to Peter Benchley. I know there was been, there's been many discussions in the past about the differences between Jaw, the Jaws novel and the Jaws movie. And yes, the Book of Quint takes off of the Jaws movie. That's what we use as canon because there's a lot of changes from the Jaws novel. However, we still have to keep it in perspective that Peter Benchley, right now, 50 years ago, one half a century ago, Peter Benchley was at his typewriter working on the manuscript for the novel Jaws, that he would not turn into J- until January of 1973 when he would have it completed and turn into his publisher. So that's a half a century ago that this one man was working on his typewriter, and because he was working on that and finished that project, that's why you are listening to my voice right now. That's why I am here talking into this microphone. That's why we all enjoy the characters of Jaws, because he came up with them and he started this whole project, the whole process of the movie, everything started with one man at a typewriter 50 years ago. Just thinking of the ripple effect that happens a half century later, just us engaging in this way and bonding over this movie, which was a product of his writing. That's us pushing and honoring the memory of Peter Benchley, making sure that that work that he did, it's pushed into the future further for other generations to enjoy. So that's where the Book of Quint comes into play. It isn't totally inspired by that. And that's why I feel very strongly about what we reveal here and the dissection of this movie, but also the writing of the Book of Quint, which is going to make the characters in Jaws come to life so much more. It brings the performances up to an entirely new level when you know the backstory to these characters. It's all because of one man and a typewriter half a century ago. Let's all keep that in perspective because that means whatever you do in your life, whatever is going on in your life right now, the little things you do, the interactions that you have with people, the little things that you do today, they can mean so much to someone going into the future. You never know. Pretty amazing just to stop and ponder all of that. The email from Kevin A. was a reminder that of all of that. So it was very special to see. Thank you very much, Kevin, for writing in. So let's get into this episode, episode 35, Time Me a Sheepshank. Now, if you are a regular listener of the Jaws Obsession, you consider yourself part of the most well-informed Jaws fans in the world. Now, this isn't just a podcast. It's a quest to learn about the subliminal undercurrents that exist in Jaws that makes it the greatest movie of all time. It's almost as if what is not seen or mentioned on screen in Jaws is just as important, if not more important, than what is shown in the movie. Can we take 30 seconds of the dialogue and visuals in this scene and extract elements of a backstory that may exist between Hooper and Quint? Is there something more to the instant friction between Quint and Hooper. Is there something more going on there? For decades, we have watched Jaws in a very linear way on one plane. I want to say the lore of the making of Jaws and the maybe the friction that Robert Shaw had with Richard Dreyfuss plays an effect in how we watch Jaws. So we tend to not watch the characters. We tend to now go, Oh yeah, Richard Dreyfuss and Robert Shaw butted heads a lot. And that's what's going on in this performance. Knowing that, it kind of takes you out of the Jaws universe. So what we're going to try to do here is we're going to try to dive right in into 
what is in this friction? What is going on here in this scene? We're going to be talking about the interior uh, inside Quint's shark and shack in the fishing shack where Brody is locking down the terms of the deal for the charter to go hunt for the great white. So Quint and Hooper, Quint and Hooper have a back and forth here. It's not just about tying me a sheep shank. There's a lot more going on in this back and forth than just tying a knot. And I would, I hope to show you that here. So let's get into this. We have to first define what is seamanship. Uh, according to America, the American Sailing Association, ASA.com, seamanship is the art of operating a vessel. Specifically, it is a compilation of the skills and knowledge entailed in navigation, boat handling, maintenance, and the law of the sea. It involves working as part of a crew when the occasion arises, leading a crew in the role of a skipper. Seamanship involves every aspect of a boat, from being tied up to the dock to the operation in open water. A proficient seaman creates a culture of awareness, safety, and confidence in the crew and the operation of a vessel at all times. Seamanship involves leading, teaching, managing, navigating, and maintaining all aspects of the operation and activity aboard the vessel. In my experience, the first thing you learn when I was in dive school for deep sea diving school from the Coast Guard, when I was in Coast Guard boot camp in Cape May, New Jersey, the first example of seamanship that you learn is knot tying. It's how to rig and secure ropes, lines, tying a boat to a dock, seamanship class, learning how to tie a bowlin, and you go from there. There's bowlin, double bowlin, bowlin on a bite, there's a Spanish bowlin, clove hitch, sheep shank, there's half hitch, girth hitch, timber hitch. There's so many different knots that you can that that you have to be able to rattle off in dive school we'd have to do that with our eyes closed blindfolded because a lot of times you work at these depths that's no visibility it's completely black so you have to learn how to tie knots without even using your eyes just by feel and it even goes on as my career at working on power lines there's a lot of rigging and knot tying when you are disassembling and assembling utility poles and power lines so Knot tying expand, expands through many different fields, okay? But for seamanship, it's the first thing that you learn is how to tie knots. Right now, we're going to focus on this sheep shank, this term sheep shank. What is a sheep shank and what is it used for? A sheep shank is a type of knot that is used to shorten a rope or take up slack. The knot has several features which make it suitable for this purpose, but it's not just to shorten a rope. One of the main features of a sheep shank, it's it, and it is going to come into play when we talk about Quint's use of one. It is to isolate a damaged section of rope. That's what a sheep shank does. What's its use? Okay, is there a practical use? There's many practical uses. For the careers that I have been in, every time, whether it was in dive school or even in the Coast Guard on small boats or on the icebreaker, when anyone mentioned a sheep shank, they would throw a, a, a piece of rope, throw a rope sling to someone say, Hooper, tie me a sheep shank. Tie me a sheep shank. And it would always be this joke. It's a running joke because Jaws is such a popular movie. Everybody knows about it. And this knot became synonymous with Jaws. Practically speaking, what we would use in the Coast Guard is we would use a lot of times we would have to uh, pull, we would have to tow in at the small boat station. We would have to go out and we would have to rescue stranded boats or stranded boaters, watercrafts that could were, you know, maybe the engine broke down and they were adrift at sea. And we'd have to tow them in. So one of the reasons why you would have to learn a sheep shank is that if you had a, a very long section of line that was on, let's say, a drum, like a reel of, of line, and that goes, it's going all the way out to another boat. And if that line, let's say, got fouled in a propeller or got scratched up where it got frayed or damaged, you really don't have time to cut, cut, and make a splice or tie two bowlins or where you secure it together. You have to take that damaged section and you have to isolate that. Now that damaged section could be two feet, three feet, it could be four feet of rope. So how do you do that? You fake that out on the deck. Faking means you lay it out on the deck, you isolate that part, and then you tie it in a sheep shank where it isolates the bad section in the middle of the shank. So now the rope is taut onto itself. It's not pulling on the frayed section. The frayed section is actually slacked and it's secured by the two uh, half hitches that are holding the line. So that's why a sheep shank is used for massive sections of bad, of frayed or damaged, damaged rope. This episode of the Jaws Obsession is not to teach how to tie a sheep shank. For that point, if you want to learn how to tie a sheep shank, 
uh, we everyone just go right to your show notes or just go right into the, the description below on your podcasting platform. Uh, you'll see the link for John Tedder's video, John Tedder over at Orca Rebuild, who's our resident Orca specialist. He did a video demonstrating how to tie a sheep shank and the variation of the sheep shank called the trumpet knot. The differences in these two knots give us an enormous clue into the backstories of Quint and Hooper. John did a visual video so you can everyone can go over and watch him and learn how to tie these knots. He demonstrates it and teaches you how to tie it. So what we're not going we're not going to get into how to tie it because this is an audio broadcast. So visually you would need a visual for that. We're going to go through not only the sheep shank but there's variants of the sheep shank, okay? There's different variants. Now, the, you, there's, there's the cat shank, there's a dog shank, there's a bell ringer's knot, but there's also a variant of the sheep shank called the trumpet knot. Now, we have to learn that there's two differences. There's a sheep shank and the trumpet knot. They kind of, they do the same thing, but in two different ways. So let's keep that in mind that there's variants of the sheep shank. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Before we get to the scene in question, we have to establish how old is Matt Hooper. Is the age of Matt Hooper given throughout Jaws? It's not given directly. However, there are clues that lead us to Matt Hooper's age, but more importantly, this plays into the, the friction or the way that Quint sees Matt Hooper. Uh, one hour, 32 minutes, and 15 seconds into the movie, in the Orca, during the USS Indianapolis speech that Quint is giving to uh, Brody and Hooper, he says this one line here. Noon the fifth day, Mr. Hooper, a Lockheed Ventura. So as he swung in low and he saw us to the young pilot a lot younger than Mr. Hooper anyway. He saw us and he come in low and three hours later a big fat PBY comes down and start to pick us up. A young pilot, a lot younger than Mr. Hooper. Noon the fifth day, Mr. Hooper, a Lockheed Ventura. So as he swung in low and he saw us to the young pilot a lot younger than Mr. Hooper anyway. So who Quinn is talking about is Quinn is talking about the pilot of the PV-1 Ventura bomber that spotted the... Uh, survivors of the Indianapolis in the oil slick from way up high came down and saw that there were survivors in the water. It was just a one in a million shot that this lieutenant saw them. Lieutenant Wilbur Chuck Gwynn. Chuck Gwynn was born on September 1st, 1920. So at the time when he was in 1945, noon the fifth day, which was August 2nd, 1945, he was 24 years old. So when he says, a lot younger than Mr. Hooper. What he's revealing here is Hooper is around 28 to 29 years old. He would he didn't say a little bit younger than Mr. Hooper or a few years younger than Mr. Hooper, which would be three. We're, we're dealing about four or five years younger than Mr. Hooper. So Matt Hooper is, you know, what Quint is revealing here is Matt Hooper is 28 to 29 years old in 1974 in the movie Jaws, okay? Because Chuck Gwynn was 24 years old, going on 25, but he was 24 when he found, when he was flying that uh, PV-1 Ventura bomber, the Lockheed Ventura, to find the Indianapolis survivors. Episode 24 was How Old Is Quint? And we used a lot of clues to find, to figure out that Quint was born around 1916. Okay, so Quint was born around 1916, which puts him at 58 years old. But when he's in the water... When he's in the water as a survivor during the US Indianap USS Indianapolis tragedy, Quint will have been about 28 or 29 years old. When Quint says, a young pilot, a lot younger than Mr. Hooper. So when Quint remembers him as a young pilot, this pilot was 24 years old. That means Quint was older than 24, okay, for him to remember a young pilot during 1945. So Quint himself was 28 to 29 years old during the tragedy of the USS Indianapolis. Now, what's interesting here is that Quint is looking at Matt Hooper. Matt Hooper is the same age as Quint was during the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. So we have to keep that in mind here. We now have Quint at 58 years old, and we have Matt Hooper at 28 years old. And Quint might be seeing a little bit of himself when he encounters Matt Hooper in the shark shack 
in this upcoming scene. So let's keep that in mind. The age of Matt Hooper does play into account here. And now that we have isolated that down, we know how old Matt Hooper was. So everybody keep that in mind. What are the two things we got to keep in mind? That there are two variants. There's a sheep shank, and then there's a variant called the trumpet knot. And we also have to keep in mind that Matt Hooper is 28 to 29 years old, and he is the same age as Quint was during the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Keep that in mind. Let's move forward. Now, this is an amazing scene. There is so much going on in this scene. We need a whole episode where maybe I could bring John Tedder on and we can just go line by line through this entire sequence because there is so much going on, not just in the dialogue between the characters, but in the visuals as well. So in order to keep it short and stay on target with the sheepshank aspect of this scene, we're just going to deal with this little bit, this 30 seconds, 30 seconds of the movie. And I'm going to take it, let's go, let's go line by line, but I'm going to take it and we're going to reveal something that's pretty amazing here, just in the way Hooper ties a knot. And these days, man, they're 60. They're all gone, these 35 years. Don't drink that. Year old Mr. Quinn. Women. Mr. Quinn. Mr. Quinn. <laughs> okay, so what we already started with is Brody... Brody's a bystander here. Brody doesn't really understand what's going on here because Brody does not have a life on the water. What you have is you have an aged captain and you have a young up-and-coming uh, sailor who is a captain in his own right. He has to have a captain's license. He pilots a boat. So you have a you have a meeting of the minds going on here and Brody is just kind of an innocent bystander. So he doesn't understand the dynamics that's going on between the two here. Because also, he's also from a more stable family environment. So Brody doesn't understand what's going on. So the shot, the offering of the shot is, it's, it's um, what, when he says, don't drink that, and then Hooper takes a taste of it with his finger and then takes the whole shot and puts it down on the table underneath the great white shark jaws that's hung from the window. All right. And he says, Mr. Quint, and he slant, he puts the, the shot glass down and Quint sees that he took the shot. Hooper taking that shot is you don't turn down an invitation to drink or eat with the captain. That's a big no-no. You just don't do that. Okay. If the captain invites you up to dinner, you're going to that dinner. You're not saying, ah, I'll take it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take a pass. I'll take a rain check. No, no, no. You all, you never turn down a shot with the captain. Okay. So that, that was a very, that's a move by Hooper to get, gain acceptance by Quint. Whereas Brody could care less, right? Cause Brody's just chief police. He's just trying to maintain law and order and he just wants to go kill the shark, but there's something else going on here. Knowing that we now have, uh, Hooper makes the first move to try to gain Quint's acceptance by taking the shot. You're going to need an extra hand. This is Matt Hooper. I know who he is. I have crewed three trans packs. Transplants. Okay, you're going to need an extra hand. And then Chief Brody cuts in and said, this is Matt Hooper. And Quint says, I know who he is. Well, that, that indicates that Quint has his back channels around the island. Quint knows who's around the island. Quint saw Hooper measuring the shark, uh, the bite radius, when the tiger shark is strung up at the dock. So Quint's already done his checking on who is Matt Hooper. So Quint knows already about Matt Hooper because he tells him that. He says, I know who he is. Well, how does he know who he is? Because he's already done his checking. Remember, Amity, if you listen to Welcome to Amity Point, episode 33, Amity is a very small island. Amity is very small. So if if you run into someone, chances are, you're only one or two degrees away from that person. It's not a six degrees of separation island. You're, you literally, if you shook hands with someone, you probably shook hands with the entire island. So Quint already says, I know who he is. As Brody says, this is Matt Hooper. So we already know that uh, Quint already knows Hooper's deal. He already knows who he is. He knows that he's a competent sailor, okay? But this is now... Quint's upper hand here. This is now Quint. He hasn't shown his cards yet. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. That's very, that was very important where he says, I know who he is. No, 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 no. He's from the oceanographic. America's Cup trial. Mr. Hooper, I'm not talking about pleasure boating or day sailing. I'm talking about working for a living. I'm talking about sharking. 
What Quint just did is he goes up and he takes his sea bag. That's a that's a Navy sea bag. Uh, we get issued those when you are a when you are in the Navy or the Coast Guard or even the Marine Corps. You get issued that sea bag, and that's what you use to transfer your uh, clothing and your personal items. When you're getting underway, you pack a sea bag, and that's what that. You, so that is what he throws down to Hooper. That's his underway sea bag. So that's his Navy stuff because that's what Quint does. Quint is in the mindset of the Navy. When he gets underway, he's wearing the same clothes he wore in the Navy. He puts himself right back on the Indianapolis when he gets underway. So he throws down that bag to see what if Hooper could handle the weight. But also he's got, he's got blood and chum on his hands. And the bag's kind of slimy and has some stuff on it because you can see Hooper kind of wipes, wipes his face as he catches the bag. So that's Quint's way of saying, let's see if you can handle a heavy weight being thrown. He's, he's testing Hooper's metal, and that's the whole point, what's going on here. But it's way deeper than that. It's way deeper than that. Remember, Hooper's the same age as Quint was during the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Quint is seeing a little bit of himself, believe it or not. Let's continue. Well, I'm not talking about hooking some poor dogfish or sand shark. I'm talking about finding a great white. Porkers? Talking about Porkers? Mr. Hooper? So, he says, I'm not talking about hooking some poor dogfish or sand shark. I'm talking about finding a great white. Quint calls great whites Porkers. We're talking about Porkers. And he's walking down the steps. Right to Hooper's right is a massive jaws of a great white shark that Quint obviously killed. Quint has had experiences before with white sharks. He even says that later on when he says he took a 16-footer, took two barrels in him to wear him down and bring him up. So Quint has killed white sharks before, great whites, calls them porkers. He has names for them. So he's coming down. There's this pause. As he's coming down the steps, he grabs a rope sling. And we call that a rope sling can be any length of rope between three, five, six, and even 10 feet. It's just a loose piece of rope. Usually it's halved up and it's, you just grab that and that's for securing equipment or securing whatever you would need a rope sling for. So he grabs one of those off of the beam as he's coming down the steps. But the pause, the pause as he's looking at Hooper here is because right to his left, Quint's left, right to Hooper's right, right on that big window is the famous white shark jaws that we see that iconic shot of the orca leaving port. So there's a white shark jaws right there. And Hooper put his shot glass right under the white shark jaws. But he challenges Quint and says, I'm talking about finding a great white. And Quint's like, get a load of this guy. Doesn't he see this jaws right here? Now, that's Hooper's way of pushing back. But Quint's not about to explain himself. There's no way Quint is going to demean himself and explain himself to the likes of Hooper. He knows Hooper can recognize a white shark jaws, but he's realizing that Hooper's pushing back. And what he's also realizing is he's seen a little bit of himself, this aggressive young sailor that Quint was back in 1945 during the sinking before and after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis during World War II, Quint's seen himself here. So what's he going to do now? How, is, how does Quint handle this? Is he going to say, you don't think I've caught white sharks? Look at this right here. That's the 16-footer I caught off Montauk. Look at that. And, you know, and Quint's not going to prove it. He doesn't have to prove himself. It's Hooper that's going to have to prove himself to Quint. And that's where Quint maintains the upper hand here. He gets the rope sling and he's just, and he's, that pause is realizing, wow, this, this guy is pushing back on me. He has no idea what he's dealing with here. He has no idea. This is not a game. To Quint, this is life or death, getting underway to go find a white shark of this, uh, of this size. So what's he do? Let's continue. Just tie me a sheep shank. I haven't had to pass basic seamanship in a long time. He throws the rope sling at Hooper's chest and he says, just tie me a sheep shank. Hooper takes it as, he rolls his eyes and he takes it as, I haven't had to pass basic seamanship in a long time. So this is something that the most junior sailors get asked. 
how to tie knots. Do you know how to tie this knot? He's looking at Quint going, oh my God, he's actually gone there. He's asking me to prove myself by tying a knot. This is so basic. But this is not what Quint's doing here. Quint is maintaining the upper hand here. Before we continue, we have to realize why would Quint ask Hooper to tie a sheep shank? Now, most people say a sheep shank is used to shorten the line. But in Quint's business of shark hunting through barrel, harpoon, and line attached to barrels, what he uses a sheep shank for is what I described earlier about the Coast Guard tow lines, why we would use a sheep shank, why we would need to know a sheep shank in case the tow line got frayed. You don't have time especially in situations you have to throw a sheep shank on it to make sure that the damaged section is not carrying the weight. And then that line stays taut because it's underweight. So that sheep shank will not come undone as long as you maintain forward momentum of your toe. He asked for a sheep shank is because Quint uses a sheep shank, obviously, to reinforce frayed or chewed or damaged sections of a line. When he can't afford to lose what's on the other end of that line, such as a shark with a harpoon dart in its back. So if you've seen later on, when the great white comes up, Brody says he's chewing his way right through that line. The sharks off Amity have been known to come back around and chew on the, on the lines. So if Quint many times would have used a sheep shank to take out a frayed section to reinforce a frayed or chewed section, could be two to three feet of rope that has got uh, has fraying or damage. That's what a sheep shank is used for. And that's how he would secure it to the stern cleats and maybe haul the shark in. So uh, what Hooper does here, okay, what he starts tying here is something completely different than a sheep shank. Let's continue. You didn't say how short you wanted it. How's that? So what happens now is Hooper ties what is called a trumpet knot. He makes that, and it's very indicative over the three loops that he makes. He does one, two, three, pulls it through the outside two loops, and then cinches it down and throws it. And he says, you didn't say how short you wanted it. So what Hooper is thinking, I'm going to show this guy, I'm going to one-up this guy. He asked me to tie a sheep shank. And in Hooper's business, a sheep shank is used to shorten a line because in sailing, that's what a sheep shank would be used for is to shorten a line without having to cut it. You would just shorten it, whether you're rigging a sailing, uh, whether it's a rigging on a mast for a sail, you would tie a sheep shank to shorten the line. So Hooper, in his mind, goes, that knot is sloppy. I'm going to show him how to tie a quicker knot, the trumpet knot, which is the same thing as a sheep shank, and it does the same thing, only you can tie it faster. So Hooper ties a trumpet knot and throws it at Quint. Now, in my younger years in the Coast Guard, we would be watching this on board the ship, and everyone would laugh and go, ha, 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 he didn't even know how to tie a sheep shank. Because what he throws at Quint, it does not look like a sheep shank. In fact, how he ties it is not, sheep shanks are, are much longer they're much longer and they can be, they can, sheep shank can be two to three feet of, of, of line. What he ties is something really quick. And he says, you don't, what we didn't understand. And I remember a bosun mate telling me this on board my, sh my ship about the trumpet knot is that Hooper was just shortening the line. He really wasn't the, that's what he was thinking Quint wanted. So years later, I remember this and what I'm realizing, what I've realized as I'm, analyzing these two characters is that Hooper is one up in Quint going, I'm not going to tie you a sheep shank. I'm going to tie you a trumpet knot. I'm going to throw it at him. And now I'm going to wait for him to go, or that's not a sheep shank. And then I will argue with him and, and show him that it's the same. It does the same thing. It, it reinforces damaged area. It, 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 it shortens a rope and, and it's tied faster. And I'm going to show him that I can be more efficient than what he than what he is. So he throws this completely different knot at Quint called the trumpet knot. How do we also know it's a trumpet knot? When he holds it up, if you go to our Telegram channel at Jawsby, at Jaws OB, 
I'm going to have some stills up there. Or you just look at the title card that's right on your this broadcast on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. Hooper's holding it up. You're going to see between the two ends of the trumpet knot, you're going to see the two lines cross. When those two lines cross, that's a trumpet knot. A sheep shank is more linear. They're more in line. When you hold it up, you'll see, and it's longer. So what he ties is, 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 is a variant of the sheep shank called the trumpet knot. So, he, so what we're proving here is that he's tying a different knot that's of the same purpose and throwing it back at Quint. But what Hooper doesn't realize is this next part, and this is the last part that we're going to get to here. Give me your hands. Quint doesn't even look at the knot. He doesn't even care about the knot. He's already heard Hooper say, you didn't say how short you wanted it. And then he throws it back at Quint. Quint's looking for the demeanor of Hooper. Can he follow an order? But also, can he follow an order exactly like I asked? I asked for a sheep shank. I didn't ask how short. I didn't say shorten this line for me using a sheep shank. I said tie a sheep shank. Because he doesn't understand that if when I'm underway and a shark has chewed through that rope, then that sheep shank is going to be the, the, the key knot into reinforcing possibly a large section. And a large section, you can't reinforce a large section. You can't reinforce three feet of line, of damaged line, with a trumpet knot. You just can't do it. You're not going to be able to make those loops. You're, you're just going to be flailing your arms all over the place. You have to tie a sheep shank. And now he goes right into the speech about uh, a five thousand uh, a $5,000 net and a great white shark chewing it up, chewing through it. What he's talking about is that these sharks will chew up the rope and you need to know the sheep shank in order to reinforce that damaged section of line so you don't lose your harpoon and you don't lose the shark that's on the end of that. Hooper does not even understand that for a second. Hooper's thinking shortening line. He's thinking like a sailor, like a, a, a transpact. He's thinking about America's Cup trials. Two different mindsets going on here. Realizing the two mindsets that are clashing here, that Hooper ties a that Hooper ties a variant knot of the sheep shank, and that's and. And already Quint doesn't even need to see the knot. He knows that Hooper's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder. If I were to tell you now that Hooper lost his father at a young age in his teenage years and that Quint lost his father at a young age in his teenage years to the sea and that Quint never had a son, but what Quint is seeing is he's seen Hooper in a fatherly way. He's seen Hooper in a prodigal son dynamic about here's this up and coming kid who was my age when I was full of life and I was at the war and he's got his whole life ahead of him and he has no idea what he's about to get into. And yet here is Hooper looking for acceptance from an older man, an older father figure that he has been without for the last 20 to 22 years of his life. So Hooper is seeing Quint as he wants to be accepted. That's where the shot glass comes from. He wants to be accepted. He wants to prove himself, and he's going above and beyond to prove himself. I'm going to tie a variant knot to the sheep shank. I am going to show this guy that I, I want. He's being overly aggressive to be accepted because Hooper was without a father. So what you're looking at is you're looking at a father and son dynamic here. If you watch the scene with that in mind about these two and their past history, the scene and the performances become that much more powerful. That it's Quint is not attacking Hooper per se because of his lifestyle. He needs to toughen this guy up so he doesn't get himself killed because Quint's seen guys Hooper's age die in the war. And Hooper needs to be accepted. He wants to be accepted because Quint is reminds him of his father, a nautical guy. Hooper says at the dinner table earlier in the movie, he says, my father got me a boat 
when he's talking about his experience off of Cape Cod with a thresher shark. So his father was a nautical person as well. So Hooper is possibly seeing his deceased father. He's looking at an ex- to be accepted by Quint in that way. So there's a father-son dynamic playing here when you know the backstories, and it's all from 30 seconds, and it's all from knowing the seamanship that's going on, the knot tying that's going on, the difference between a sheepshank and a trumpet knot. It's beautiful, it's fantastic, and it all fits. And now, as you watch the movie progress with this dynamic, that's st- watch the rest of the movie now with this father-son dynamic and watch how Quint and Hooper interact with each other. It's as if the old father trying to toughen up the young son. That's what's going on here. And it's beautiful. And it works. It works when you look at that. And as the movie progresses, progresses, when Quint calls Hooper Hoop, he says, hey, Hoop, just put your head under my cap. You feel that lump there? When they're talking scars inside the orca, by him saying Hoop, that's a term of endearment that Quint uses. So he grows closer to Hooper as it, as it goes on. And the same with Hooper to Quint. There's, there's an acceptance, there's, there's an admiration that goes on with Hooper to Quint. And we could even go further the very next scene when Quint is asking him about the shark cage. And then Quint goes to sing the fair Spanish ladies verse. Hooper just smiles and listens in a respectful way. He doesn't say, this is a crazy guy and walk away. He smiles and listens to Quint sing that verse in a very, very respectful way. That dynamic doesn't just stop at this scene. It plays through the rest of the movie. It's wonderful to watch. You know, earlier today, I know we're running long here. But well, one more thing is earlier today, I put on for my, for my youngest daughter, who's going to be six years old. When I record these episodes, I, I tell her, I say, okay, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't be running around, no jumping, because you can sometimes hear her in the background through the microphone. So what I did was I put on a movie for her, and I said, if you can just be quiet for a little longer while I get this recording done. Well, I put on the movie Clash of the Titans. I think it's from 1981, you know, starring Harry, Harry Hamlin, Laurence Olivier. Great movie a myth, uh, about, myth, mytho- about the Greek mythology. Uh, it's a movie I, w- I grew up with, but I put that on for her, and I'm trying to explain some of the stuff that's happening. What makes Clash of the Titans a fascinating movie, it's not exactly what's on screen, As I went through school and I started learning about Greek mythology and learning about these characters of Zeus, of Poseidon, Aphrodite, Queen Cassiopeia, and all these different, all the Pegasus and all the different uh, mythological characters, there's backstories to each and every one of them, Perseus and Medusa. So what happens is, is the more you learn about those backstories, then you watch Clash of the Titans again, and it becomes that much more fascinating to watch that because you know, oh, that's that, that's that one, and that one had a relationship with that one, but you know, off of outside of the Clash of the Titans movie. And it's in episodes like this when we talk about Jaws has become. Richard Dreyfuss said in an interview that there is not a there is not a society or country on Earth that Jaws has not touched. So Jaws is part of many different cultures across the world, across the globe. So in many ways, Jaws has become a a very mythological story in itself that spans cultures and generations. So what episodes like this do, just watching a little bit of Clash of the Titans and remembering about Greek mythology, is that when you have the myth a mythological story is more impactful as you know the details of the characters outside of that story. And that's what we're kind of doing here. We're taking the mythology of Jaws and we are actually learning about the backstories. And that's what makes Jaws the greatest movie of all time because it keeps getting better every year, every for with every little bit that we learn, with every little 30 seconds like we just took today. With every little 30 seconds that we dive into, we learn that much more, it takes a whole different tone. And that's what's so cool. That I think that's what's fascinating 
um, about this that I learned a lot about Matt Hooper and Quint just by doing this episode and the research into this episode and, and all that went on with my experience with not tying and sheep shanks and all that, that I've learned a lot about Matt Hooper and Quint. And that's what I can then incorporate that into the book of Quint. There's much more to talk about later on regarding the book of Quint and even just this scene. But for now, thank you very much for allowing me to walk you through this scene and for expanding your mind, opening up your mind to the possibility that there is much more going on that we are not shown in the movie Jaws. There's much more going on in the undercurrent and the emotional content between these characters. And it's fascinating to watch. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. Now remember, if you want to watch that scene in its entirety, just go over to Orca Rebuild at YouTube or just follow the links below. John Tedder includes that scene in his video. And then he demonstrates how to tie a sheep shank and how to tie a trumpet knot. And he shows the differences. So you actually can watch what Hooper's trying to do and what uh, the difference between what Hooper's trying to do and what Quint instructs him to do. Fascinating to watch. Thank you very much to John Tedder for making that video because that's much needed here. If everyone goes over there after listening to this, you'll get the full picture of what we just talked about. So the movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. There's still time to get in line for the Book of Quint to receive the postcard of Amity Island. It is now, let's see, the 23rd. So you got four more days. Get four more days to get in line and you'll be on the list if you've already reserved your copy of the Book of Quint. You are getting that postcard, so you don't have to do anything. But whoever wants to jump on board, you have four more days left. The postcards look really cool. They're coming out nicely. Thank you very much for listening to the show. JawsOB2025 at gmail.com. Until next week, farewell and adieu. Show me the way to go home. Show me the way to go home.